Hello, fans on Wikia. I'm Ty Frank. I'm Daniel Abraham. And we're here to answer your questions. Sci-fi let us have a lot of fun with a lot of things. We had a very, I think, light hand on us when it came to how would it go about the adaptation. And they let us take some, some narrative risks that I really appreciate. What exactly space opera is is a, a pretty nebulous question. Everybody has a very clear idea of it until they start trying to get it down to what actually counts and what doesn't, and then it starts to get a little fuzzier. It's a way to denigrate a whole genre that has then been adopted and recast and remade into uh, something to be proud of. I think the opera part of the space opera is the human part. It's the emotional part. It's the, the melodrama. That's the part that I think sometimes gets lost, the emotional core of the characters. The science fiction is a setting and a set of obstacles and a plot that these people are going through, but what's really the thing that brings you there is the part that's recognizable. Any adaptation, you're gonna to have to make some changes. I think the important thing for the two guys who wrote the pilot and have sort of been overseeing the entire writing process, Mark Fergus and Hawk Osby, their thing was they didn't wanna lose the spirit of the books because that's why they took the job, that's why they wanted to do it, is to write that story. Um, so they never really wanted to diverge too far from that. But there are things you can do in a different medium that you'd be crazy not to take advantage of. In the early part of the first book, a lot of Detective Miller's story is very internal. And you know, early on we talked about that, how do we dramatize that because entire episodes of Detective Miller sitting in his apartment drinking and feeling bad uh, would be not exciting television. So how do you show that he's sort of lost his way and has this internal uh, void where his, his sense of purpose used to be, but do it by having him go do things? Um, so that, you know, that's a change. And then the other one is, is uh, you know, we have a narrative structure that we follow. We're sort of a tight third person. We follow various characters through the story. Um, so it kind of seems like some characters pop out of nowhere into the story. That's just an aspect of the way we write it. But those people exist in the universe. And one thing you can do in TV is show what they're doing when they're not part of uh, the narrative that was happening in the book. So in the first season, we bring Christian Navasarala into the story because of course she existed during that story and she probably had an opinion on the events that were happening. We just didn't show what those were because we never run into her with our point of view characters. Um, so we can do things like that and say, oh, what is Navasarala up to? Why does she think about this thing that Holden just did? Um, and that's, that's nice, I think it actually, rather than cutting things out of the story, we actually broaden the story and show more of the story than uh, people got in the book. Some of both. Um, yeah, I, I think that there are also some very minor characters who have, uh, you know, a line or two in the books who have, who kind of expand into this larger role in the, the adaptation and folks who uh, were kind of you know, large second string characters in the book who, who for one reason or another, uh, what they were doing kind of collapsed when we, when we folded it into the, the script. We have three main storylines in the show, and, and two of those are the two point of view characters from the first book. You know, we sort of follow Miller on his journey, we follow Holden on his, and then we all we've done is add the third storyline of Asarala and what's going on in the political world. But you can never mirror tight third person on screen. There's no way to do that. So no, we're not gonna replicate tight third person um, on the TV show. Authors should uh, get whatever they think they can. Uh, it's a tough business, um, but if you're going to do it, uh, you have to go into it knowing that it's a collaboration. I think the reason that 
Hollywood is very hesitant to include original uh, IP creators in the adaptation process is people can be a little too precious with their material. And if you come into it with, it will be my vision on screen and mine alone and any deviation from what I said or wrote, um, it's gonna be a fight, then they're not gonna want you there. But if you come into it saying, uh, here's the template for the story. What do you want to change? Uh, well, and, and, and we already, our internal process is best idea wins. So if I write a chapter that includes a scene that Daniel's not in love with, and he says, uh, let me pitch you an alternate scene, and it's better, the rule is I have to go, yeah, no, you're right, that's better. Let me pull mine out and put that one in. Um, and that's all Hollywood is, uh, when it's working well, when you, know, when you get the best version of it, is in a writer's room, you have a bunch of people sitting around a table talking about the story. The goal is that they all care about the story, the goal is that they all want to produce good work, and everybody should have that rule that no matter what corner it comes from, the best idea wins. One of the things that, that Ty has talked about in other realms is the illusion that because you're good at one thing, you must be good at everything. I wrote a lot of novels. That doesn't mean I know how to write a screenplay. I came in learning to write a screenplay. I came in learning how to take this toolbox and what this toolbox does that's different and interesting and how it compares. If I came in with the assumption that because I had written a novel, I was clearly good at everything, it would have fallen apart. We came in knowing that, you know, we didn't know much. That, that forgives a lot. The biggest way it's affecting how we write the novels is that we don't have time to write the novels. So that has created some problems that we're only starting to figure our way through and some changes to the process that are probably uncomfortable for both of us but are necessary. As far as story stuff, no. Nah. We're not going to change the way we write the novels because of the TV show. And it's interesting because there is this bifurcation in my head anyway between uh, the characters on the show and the characters in the books. So I, I totally love everything that Wes has done with Amos. It's a great version of Amos. It's not quite the version of Amos that's shown up in the books. They speak a little differently, they move a little differently, um, but one's like a shadow of the other. They're connected, but they're not exactly the same. And I think as long as I can, I'd like to maintain that sort of that sort of difference where the different retellings are internally consistent um, and they inform one another, but, but they're not bleeding. On the other hand, there's Shirei Yagdashlu is, is Christian Avasarel in my head now. There's just, they, they fit too well, so. <laughs> Well, we had all the choice at the beginning and then none after that. Yeah. Before we agreed to sell the option and, and then later the, the license, we had absolute control. We had a number of teams pitch us their version of what they wanted to do. So when we met Mark and Hawk and, and talked to them about what they wanted to do with the story and, and their sort of their vision for how they would adapt it, we were the ones who got to say, yes, we pick you. Once we had done that and signed the contracts and taken the money, then we had no choice. We were very fortunate in that Mark and Hawk, who now had all the power, um, liked working with us. We all, the four of us, got along really well. So they elected to keep us involved in the process. So we got to meet a lot of the writers before they were actually hired and you know, sit and have a drink with them, that kind of thing. Um, but actual power, no. <laughs> It's a minor thing in the story, Stars My Destination, but it really resonated with me when, when the main character, Gully Foyle, goes to the Sargasso asteroid. And you have all these people who've been living on this asteroid for generations, and their culture has changed, and their, their uh, language has changed. They're living on things that have been recycled a dozen times, because they're just, they have, no, they have no money. But the image of that, of people sort of trapped in these hollowed out rocks in space, trying to scrape a living together. I find that very uh, tragic and compelling at the same time, just that, that image. And so, like we always do with science fiction, you take modern things and you move them into 
you know, some genre version of it, and that's who our belters were, is these people sort of who don't have a choice about where they are, don't have choices about the conditions that they live in, and are just trying to survive, just trying to make it. So yeah, that, that was in there from the beginning. And, and we also wanted to talk about racism without talking about racism. Humanity doesn't change as much as you think it's gonna change. I mean, if you look at what was going on in the 1800s and the 1600s and the 1400s and ancient Rome, eh, a lot of it looks very familiar. A lot of the uh, election campaigns look very familiar. A lot of the uh, violence and the fear and the oppression, eh, recurs. It's not, it's not, you know, consistent all the way through, but there are things that, you know, when we go to the planets, when we go to the stars, um, there are some problems we're going to pack with us. And I think that was one of the things we wanted to say with the show and with the books.